Welcome along to the Cart Chronicles podcast, episode number 63. I'm sorry for the wait. I know it's been a little while. Um, had numerous things come up, main thing. Um, OptiBates, my bait company, the unit that I operate out of, um, it flooded, which has caused no end of headaches. And to be honest, is still causing lots of headaches. So yeah, my time has been really, really sparse. So apologies it's taken me so long. Um, but we are back with a superb episode on Carp Vision with a very interesting chap called James Noel. I think you're going to really love this episode if you're into the more kind of scientific side of carp fishing. Um, despite looking at scientific papers on receptors, digestion, all different kind of sciencey things to do with bait, I've never really looked into the vision side of things. I find it fascinating. It's something that I've just never really tried to dive into it and wrap my head around it. But James has, and he's got some very interesting things to share on it. Um, so definitely one for the carp geek. And yeah, I think you'll really enjoy it. Of course, before we jump into the episode, must mention my awesome sponsor, which is Target Baits. If you haven't visited their website, I urge you to do so. You can do that at targetbaits.co.uk. They sell a whole host of ingredients for the discerning carp angler and bait maker at really good prices and it's super fresh as well and you can get 10% off your order by entering the code CC10 at checkout. It's actually when you go onto the payment method page you'll see a little green section you can click an arrow it says apply discount code just put in CC10 and you'll save yourself 10% I don't get anything for that but it helps you guys out it saves you a bit of money it's a win-win and it's a really good fresh ingredients from that company as well so i would urge you to check them out that is targetbaits.co.uk of course my own little bait company optibaits i've got a few new products on the website mainly salmonax which has been a while coming but i now have secured salmonax long term it's fresh it's not old out of date stuff that will be of interest to a lot of you. I know it's got a bit of a cult following. And I've got a few new products online as well. So check out optibates.com. That's it for the intro. Please enjoy this very interesting podcast with James Noel. James, welcome to the podcast. I think you've got a tipple lined up, haven't you? Yes, I have a tipple of the episode. Um, it's called, uh, it's an indie pound. But it's a cannabis drink, so oh. rather than than a, yeah, it's an IPA that's a cannabis drink that uh, has been made to taste like an IPA. So is that got CBD in it or THC? It's Cause, got both. Because that's legal over your way now, right? It, it is, yeah. So we've been five years um, with legal weed, and um, they've it's available, you know. Wow. Bud and flour and that sort of thing, but resins and and they're incorporating it into foods and drinks. You can go and get jellies and chocolate and that sort of thing. And um, someone decided to try and make a a beer with it. So I've got like a it, it's an in English IPA, but uh, instead of alcohol, it's got some THC and CBD. So hopefully, I won't be falling asleep before the yeah. end of this. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think is the has been the effect of legalizing cannabis over there? Um, it's, I'm not sure it's changed much. So, yeah. so it, it, I, there was a lot of people like weed was normal here. There's a lot of people who smoked it. Uh, um, and when it became legal, that, that, that just that now you can go and get it from a shop, you can go and buy it from a bricks and mortar shop. You, uh, um, you can buy it online, whatever, but I'm not sure. So it's like, you know, people aren't walking around like zombies, completely stoned or anything no, like that. You don't get that. The, the, I mean, I don't know of people that age, but you don't know many stoners. I don't know any stoners of, of our age. I don't know people that are like really, really stoned and all they do is lay on the couch and smoke weed all day. Yeah. There's, there's none of that. People just use it as a, as like a supplement to alcohol, you know, uh, um, and even before it was legal, I would go to, um, you go to a pub and then you go outside, like people would go outside for a cigarette and most of the group, I'd say three quarters of the group were smoking weed rather than, than cigarettes really? and stuff. So, it's, you know, cigarettes are kind of looked down on a bit uh, here, but mm. weed is, is normal. And it's like, it's across the whole country. It's, 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 you know, 
different different provinces sell sell it in different ways but wherever you go wherever you are outside um you can smoke or vape weed yeah. wow hmm. interesting i imagine at some point the uk will catch on but um I, i'd like to think so i mean it, it, i think there's going to be a it's a generational thing i think there's certainly like my parents generation that that you know through the 60s and 70s they were fully aware of it being harmless you know it doesn't it doesn't do much anyway it doesn't turn people into the you know the reef of madness zombies or anything like that no. um i think the us is pretty close there's there's quite a few states in the us now that um have have legal like whether it's medical or 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 you can go and buy it from from shops and stuff and i think federally uh, it's not far off but actually that's it's a bit of a problem with that is that you've got all these companies that um are allowed to sell weed and stuff but you can't use banks and stuff there's only certain banks that do it because federally in the u.s it's illegal and right. the uh the government could if they wanted to the federal government could go after them for drug dealing right. could... interesting yeah but it's uh you know, the world's changing and uh um it, it, it's i'd say it's pretty pretty harmless in my opinion it's people don't end up fighting after consuming no. weed they're usually a lot more more uh, more relaxed and stuff so we'll see it just, and it's a big you know big business yeah i can imagine it just my only problem with i don't i don't do it but i have done in the past my only problem is it just makes me lazy you know, i just don't right i just don't want to do anything you know and and again as as i just said i don't do it now so, have done years right. ago but it didn't so, yeah yeah yeah. So what they've done is is with it going legal is is that there are so many different strains out mm. there now that um, you can have different strains that give you different effects. So they they've got like um, it's called a turpin profile. So there's all you know there there is a little bit of terpenes in fishing, but they have the terpene yeah. profiles in weed, uh, and it dependent on the profile is what it would do. So certain and I can't remember them off the top of my head now, but certain will make you feel more energetic and happier and, and more giggly and that sort of thing. And then there'll be others that will stick you in wheelchair mode, you know, and, and, and sit you down and completely, um, uh, so you can't move, you know, it, it, it's, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't know it's due to the terpenes. I, I, um, I think sativa, um, strains are, that's are right, more yeah. kind of uplifting and then indica are more sort of, that's right. Yeah. I don't know. Not depressive, but you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I sort of up and down. And, and mm. happy and relaxed and stuff but um yeah they've got all, all sorts now that there's people there's growers and, and farms where they'll be um crossing certain strains to try and come up with new strains and that sort of thing and if you go on to, to the government websites where you can actually so the, the government in ontario is actually the wholesaler which sounds mad doesn't it uh, um but the supply all the shops as well so you can either buy straight from the government or the shops um and just go onto their website and there there are tens of thousands of different strains and they all do slightly different things and all with slightly different prices and wow. that sort of thing but it's the other thing with it as well is that i think for bang for your buck it's probably cheaper than booze on on, on what what they sell here would you know what as far as i'm aware i think you'll be the first guest on the podcast that's been under the influence of uh of marijuana <laughs> prob- um, do you know what i imagine someone has been legally like- yeah, yeah legally maybe although i can't think of anyone who would have I, there must be someone no. i don't know yeah um yeah. yeah anyway we are obviously here to talk about a topic which i am definitely not well versed on at all it's outside of my wheelhouse firmly um but it's very much inside your wheelhouse which is the vision of cart which as i just said i haven't really looked into it the bits i have looked at kind of fried my brain um and it just it's never been something that i've really thought worthy of pursuing now that being said when i think of it i think it's probably very worthy of pursuing and i think during this podcast i'm going to um you know it, it increase my belief in that more and more but this is an area that you've obviously done a lot of work in what first made you want to look into pun not intended carp's vision ha um so I think the first first time I ever uh, had really considered it was um, on a on a fishing forum years ago. Uh, uh, there was the, the carp forums, the Black Forum, and um, it was actually the guy that designed the ATTS alarms. A guy called Techno Tom had put a thing up saying carp see this thing called NIR light, near infrared light. Uh, um, 
what do you think that means? And there had been a big conversation on it, and, and people had. Um, th- there was an article posted. I think. I think there's a guy called. Um, oh, I was going to say Steve White, but that's not his name. Steve Howard, uh, uh, and he'd written an article in Carp Addict, and he posted it up. And it was basically what they were saying was there was this type of light, near infrared light, that Carp could see. So I. I I was like, okay, that's interesting. What does that mean? And I couldn't find out where near infrared light came from. You know, it's, it's one of those things uh, um, completely invisible to us. You know, we, we, we can't see it at all. Uh, um, and actually, it's so much so that we we use it for useful stuff. So your TV remote controls, uh, 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 near infrared light, you know, that's the, the light that comes out of those that hits your TV. Um, if you've got cruise control in your car, uh, uh, that's near infrared light as well. And And, you know, it, it, it's got certain properties that make it quite interesting. So, um, so back then, I, I this uh, this thread had just made me think. You know, so there's there's stuff that we don't know about it. I kind of don't pay as much attention to it as, as other people say. Was was my thought then? Um, and then the years went by, and uh, um, I know a few other people have have written about it. And you see the odd article there. Uh, Dean has actually wrote an article in his book, and his book it was a copy of something he put out in Big Carp and he's got some quite interesting theories on it too and what he actually talks about in his and, he, and and Dean put me on to was that there's actually other light that Carp can see that's invisible to us uh, which is UV light so we've got these two two different types of light that are completely invisible to humans but there have been scientific studies and scientific papers that, that basically prove that, that they can see it um then uh, a couple of years ago, I can't remember what it was, but it came up again, and I thought I'm going to go and d- dig a little bit more into this. I'm going to I'm going to see and, and find out more because again, we don't you know, people people say, oh yeah, you watch a video and people will be saying, oh yeah, we've put a pink bait on, and he's definitely saw that, or he's definitely saw the lead, or or, or you know he's definitely seen the lion, and I think there's a what we do as humans is we've always assumed that carp see exactly as we do because you see things with your own eyes it's exactly um you, you trust it 100 percent, so that must be what the, the the carp see too so i went and, and did a bit more digging and, and and looked and um found a scientific paper that had, had said that they'd done some tests that said uh, uh they'd had some carp kept in some tanks and they shone near infrared. They kept them in a dark, dark space, and then they turned on a, a, a diode um, that emitted near infrared light in this wavelength. Excuse me. Again, we, we would not be able to see it, and the carp um, reacted. So, so what happened was, I think that they were measuring their heart rates, and when this light was turned on, the fish's heart rates went went up. So. Was like, okay, so that's that's interesting. They've got uh, that actually creates a physical reaction in them. They can definitely, they can definitely see this. So um, I went and looked a bit more, and 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 you know, as far as I was concerned, they they, they could definitely see near infrared light. So I wanted to know a little bit more about what near infrared light was, uh, and how it is around us, and if they can see it. You know, is there something that we can we can do? So I looked at some more papers, and then I looked at. Um, again, what, what near infrared light is and where it comes from, and it's it's actually uh, um, like the dominant light in the universe, uh, and is around us all the time. But again, we can't see it. Um, it's it comes from uh, uh, our biggest source of light around us, and it helps us see see color and everything. Um, is the sun, uh, and, and we get this light that comes to us in, in a thing called electromagnetic radiation right it, it, it's all it, very scientific and you know where uh, in carp fishing we took a lot more in chemistry around bait and stuff this is kind of physics uh, uh side of things but so we get all this energy comes from the sun and there's a, a certain uh um amount of this energy that we can detect with our eyes that, that help us see things and we call that the visible spectrum um and these scientific papers what they've done is that they've gone and they've performed uh, within these scientific papers, these scientists have gone and performed these tests on the fish, um, and they've proved that basically they can see um, light outside of our visible spectrum, or they can see this energy outside of our visible spectrum, um, and they react to it. So I was yeah. So I went and looked and, and 
uh, where it comes from and um most of it's the sun but also it's it's really uh um stars like 80 percent of the light that they put out is near infrared light so if you see a star in the sky uh um, it will be 80 percent brighter of near infrared light coming out too um and you know, there's some other properties around it. There's some other things about what what it does. Is um, it means that it, it can travel through clouds because of the the wavelength is slightly different. And again, this is it sounds crazy, but it's just you know it's one of those things. It's one of those scientific things that uh, um, you know this electromagnetic energy uh, um, dependent on on the wavelength of it. So uh, um, you can have really really uh, uh, short wavelength of the electromagnetic would be um uh, uh, x-rays you know for, for looking through your body and and that sort of thing that that's right. the same thing it's light but in a, in a, in a, a shorter wavelength and then longer wavelength would be like radio signals for for, for listening to football or, or or you know radio tv signals that sort of thing and communications so it's this massive range of energy that we use for all these different things but there's a certain part of it that we can see um and and it just turns out that the the bit that uh, um, this this near infrared light comes from stars and it can go through clouds, so it means that our world is bathed in it all the time, even on the darkest nights when when you're there and 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 sitting, you know and you can't see your hand in front of your face, there is a, a good chance that there will be near infrared light coming onto and and if you could see near infrared light, in fact. You see the army put on their goggles, and and, and you see the, the 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 night vision stuff. That's based on near infrared light, magnified and and enhanced, so we can see. So, say on that that you know pitch black night, we can't see our yeah. hand in front of us. Do carp detect enough of this light spectrum to be able to see the bottom of the lake bed when they're let's say a foot away from it, or do they have that ability? Or well. I think it, it, it. First of all, it will depend on what depth they're at, because uh, uh, obviously, as you go down deeper light into water, uh, 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 the light penetration, and, and I think you know that there's the you know, the stories about red line is being used because it disappears over certain depths mm. and that sort of thing, and, and moving around. Um, so, so I think the deeper it is, the less that's there. But certainly in the top layers and and, and towards the surface, I think that they. Sh- should probably from the stuff i've read be able to see pretty well at night uh um i say even on cloudy nights um some of the other interesting things about about it as well is that um on a full moon the moon actually um reflects a lot a lot more red light so when we see the light coming off the sun because of the way that it reflects off rocks and stuff there's a lot more red light in the white that we see and a lot more near infrared light coming off the moon at night so when uh, people are talking about going out and fishing on a big moon and and those sorts of things and 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 the odds are it's like having a a light and you know i personally think it's because they can see a lot more Um, yeah so 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 going back to the the thing around the um it traveling through clouds so so again you can i think you'll you'll get it to a certain extent in you if you've driven a um in your car with cruise control, uh, uh, it would still work if it's a bit misty and there's a bit of rain. Uh, um, and that's kind of like the, the example of that. Um, but also what it means is that they can see through cloudy water. So when you've got turbid water and you've got muddy water and stuff, there's there's a good chance that they can see using this near infrared light. Um, they'll be able to to see stuff when we can't see it. Um, so, so how do we know? is is down to scientific papers so so you know i think that within carp fishing we with there's a certain amount of literature out there and and you know people write books and technical books and you see stuff on forums and you know people get really into it but um a common carp is is a really really important species on earth at the moment i think right now globally it's the third highest farmed fish and they actually look at it because of the growth rates and because of uh, um, you know how quickly they can take over waters and how hardy they are. Um, they're actually looking at it as a food source, you know. And if it's not necessarily for humans, then then for other animals as well. 
It's, it's um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. It's the third most farmed fish. Who's? I think it's the third far, most farmed freshwater fish globally. Oh, freshwater fish. Yeah, freshwater fish. The salmon. Yeah. W- salmon are going to be way ahead of most I, things. I think so. Yeah. 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 But okay. but when it comes to fresh freshwater fish, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of this eaten in Asia and and uh, um, and certainly across Eastern Europe. You know, we, right. we hear the stories of Romania and and um, oh yeah, uh, uh, where they. Is it hungry as well? Would they have it on Christmas Day and and that sort of thing? So, um, yeah, it's a lot. A lot of people eat it. So, what there's a lot of science being done on the fish to try and uh, uh, find out as much as they can about it, because it, 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 if they can make these fish, if it's easier for them to farm them and easier to grow them, then then it's cheaper food. You know, it's going to get to the point where you know it'll be chopped up into something and used as fish filler or, or whatever. But at some day. Um, it'll be useful, more useful for humans than than going and and chucking some boilies in a lake and trying to catch them. Mm. So you know this this kind of going on in the background, and and if you go on to I think Science Direct is the the, the website, um, and just search common carp. There's like forty, there's close to I think it's thirty eight and a half thousand scientific papers on common carp just available there. You can go in and look at, and. Um, the 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 stuff that that's in there is fascinating. I, I went and I was just looking the other day, like in preparation for this, and uh, just just this year, the, there's stuff on there. Um, addition of turmeric uh, um, to their foods. Uh, apparently, it encourages growth, skin um, immunity, um, and helps with reduction of fish in transit. So so if you're moving moving fish around, like it brings the stress levels down, and and they measure measure all of that um there's stuff on fungal insecticides and and environmental chemicals and how that affects carp as well and, and all of these are are all oh, they've taken a sample of fish and then they've under lab conditions that you know that, that they will go and um do full-on tests it's not just a, a you know a, a tank test and we're going to pour some liquid in and just see how happy they are it, it's they're measuring their heart they're measuring uh um their actions, brain stuff. There's, there was some stuff that I read recently on um, uh, uh, measuring the stress and, and looking for the actual genes that, that uh, um, flash when, when a carp is stressed. So, so you know, when, when Dean's talking about the, the addictive uh, qualities of, of milk proteins and, and, and that sort of thing, you know, he said he'll never know, but if he goes and does a bit of a, a digging on the papers, he'll find out what genes he can follow and, uh, and tell someone else that this is what they want to do and, and they can measure measure the effects. Um, yeah, so it's fungal insecticides. There's a thing on characteristics of fatty acid receptors, something we don't really talk about in fishing bait at all. Mm-hmm. Um, addition of medlar fruit, which is a, a, um, a, a fruit found in Asia on... on um, there's a lot at the moment on antioxidants and, and carp immunity because yeah. they want to be breeding fish without using antibiotics. So they're looking at all these ingredients and all these things that make them healthy. So it's so a lot of stuff on that. Um, uh, and there was one that uh, uh, I thought was pretty interesting that, that I wanted to mention. And um, it was about using salt. Uh, and I know it's something within bait and people use it at adding its fish but um it turns out that it's actually pretty bad for them uh and there's a paper i've not got the name of it but it was one of the ones that have been produced this year like this month and it had said uh, i've got the quote here um although common salt reduced the water ammonia and the fish stress responses uh so they're talking about transporting fish here um it, its use in isolation is not recommended. It has caused oxidative damage to the livers and gills. These effects have not been previously reported in, the, in any other literature. What so, uh, concentration no, are they receiving that salt in? Though I, it's all in there. It's all it's all in with within the, the um, uh, within the article. I don't I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, but okay. Okay. what what's interesting about these papers as well is that um, they kind of. I don't know if there's like a bit of a competition going on between the scientists because when mm. they talk about their lab conditions and what they go through and the tools that they use for measuring it, it's kind of going off the scales when you read these lists and these testing things and what they did and the models that they use and and, and all that sort of thing. It's it's just like this is about as much proof as we can give you. But but this was a you know, that thing around the salt 
obviously there are some things with uh, um, with fishing where where it does benefit on the attraction, but it's not necessarily that good for them for their livers and gills. So I think people have been saying for a while though, you know, don't use too much of it, and that kind of proves it a little bit for me. Yeah. But, but um, whilst I think of it, ping these across to me at some point if you don't mind. Oh, I will do. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Of course, not not a problem at all. I, I, I'm more than happy to. Um, there was another one on on uh, the use of clove oil. Uh, um, as I said, like, um, again for transportation, and what they what they found was that clove oil again um, it's, a, it's sedative, uh, relaxant, antioxidant, and immunosuppressant. Um, but what they found with clove oil was that if you use clove oil with a small amount of salt, it had better effects. So if you're transporting things like fish around in tanks and bags, um, you know there's a bit of. I mean, you talked about. Uh, um, symbiotic effects on, on the podcast before people, but this was evidence that, that that salt has got like a symbiotic effect. It works with with different things in different ways. I I believe salt can act as um, almost like a receptor primer. Although I mean that that, that wouldn't right. make sense why it made them more sedate. Um, but yeah, interesting. yeah, yeah. I mean, I. It, I so, so uh, it contributed to the stress within the article was actually mm. around its blood glucose, and salt is important within carp uh, um, to control their well the amount of blood glucose that goes into their body. And I, I can come on to that one uh, maybe an, another time um, when you start looking at sugars in bait and sugars for carp fishing too. Yeah, I know but yeah, so 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 just going back to well. it, uh, we've Sorry, got off on a little say, bit. Of I know you've looked into tangent. um into that side of things as well. And- you know, perhaps yeah. that's another podcast at a later date. But uh, yeah. sure, sure, we have we have long Canadian winters, and and I do like to read a lot. And <laughs> uh, uh, you kind of disappear off down into. You know, people have uh, um, YouTube rabbit holes, but I kind of have a uh, a science direct paper rabbit holes. And you you go onto a paper, and then yeah, and at the you know it'll be a reference reference to another one, and then a reference to another one, and you just open those up and go on and. Not not everything, and it makes sense. You know, you'll you'll read through, and there'll be loads of stuff that's you know way over my head. But you'll pick little bits up. Excuse me. Um, but but yeah. So just going back to the the, the eyesight and the vision. Um, I found this paper that had said all of this stuff around the near infrared light, and then there's there's other papers that out there too that talk about uh, the UV light and how they see things with the UV light. Um, and, and so the UV and and the near infrared, they 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 have two. A couple of different things. There's a couple of different things about them that, that I think we should probably consider a little bit more in, in carp fishing. Um, I'm not saying. So what, what I'll say with this as well is that you know I'm not going to. I've not got all the answers, but it would be if other people can can think about. Oh, this happened or this happened. Could it be because of their eyesight? Could it can be that they can see this? Um, so yeah. So near, near infrared light. The other one was the the UV light. So um, and I think just going back to the the visible light and what we can see um are you familiar with dark side of the moon the pink floyd album cover with the light hitting a prism there's there's like a triangle on it yeah of course so so that is that that that's a way that white light is is split out into the colors of the rainbow you know the, the visible spectrum that we can see um the scientific tests have basically said that either side of those colors that we can see there's light either side of those that they can see as well. So they've got like another two base colors within their rainbow at either end, one on the UV side and then one on the infrared side. Um, but what, the, uh, and the other thing around this is, so, so they've done the tests where they've gone and looked at uh, um, how they react to this light as well. But then they've gone and the actual biology of going in and doing a dissection and then looking at the makeup of their eyes as well. Um, carp have got like a slightly different makeup within their eyes uh, um, to humans too. And we see we see three colours. So we see red, green and blue, uh, uh, um, which um, if you go and, you know, if you've ever gone up really close to a TV screen and put your eyes up against it, you'll see that all the colours on the screen are all made up of the, the old bulbs where, where are red, green and blue bulbs. Um, and then... We see those colours, and then every other colour that we see is a combination of them, which is kind of where we go into a little bit of a head head fuck here. So we we see three, and carp see four, so they've got four of them. So so so, so, so which which three do we 
see. So, so um, they call them short, medium, and long. Um, but basically, within the, the spectrum, um, we've got one that picks up the kind of the the, the blue end of it, one that the is sensitive to the green part of it, and one that's sensitive to the red part of it. Thanks. So what you've got colors colors within the spectrum that are, uh, and this is like I say, it's where 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 it gets really confusing that we don't actually see the light for. We just make them up in our heads, mm. which is crazy. But, but, but it's, it's just the way that, that our eyes have evolved so much over the years that um, dependent on the hue and the intensity and the amount of a color, it can make it appear as a slightly different color. So which is not have four. What, what, what are so they? Have four. Right. What do they so they have, um, I think if you, if you were to look at the spectrum, they would have like something rather than a blue, like a little bit more of a, an indigo on our part. So further to the left, um, then most likely a blue, um, I think possibly a yellow and then the red, but it's all, all, you know, when they, when they go in and look at them and they, and they test these cells, they're called, um, cone cells, uh, uh and these cells that they, the proteins that react to um, the electromagnetic waves hitting them. So to bring it back for yes, idiots like me, that's fine. What does this mean for us anglers? So, so what does it mean for us? So, so the, the so there's a couple of things. Uh, 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 um, the first one is that thinking that carp have bad eyesight and thinking that they are better at sniffing and better at tasting food and everything that we do around bait is should be completely reversed uh, and we should actually consider or, or you know the evidence that i've seen is that they're actually they've got better eyesight than humans because they can see light that is invisible to us um and you know uh, so so what that means is that they can see because of this extra cone cell uh, where we've got three we've got three cells that means we see about two million colors um because of this fourth cell, they probably can see about fifty million colours. So we can. So, so yeah. sorry, James. Sorry. You, you yeah, look, I know. That, which is like which you're is talking crazy. to a child. I know. <laughs> That's fine. But no, 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 no. It's fine. It's we, fine. we can we can basically see these three colours, but we blend them to make up around about two million different colours. Did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's just the different combinations of these threes, and it's like hue and intensity. Of them. yeah of course i get that uh, yeah. um yeah and our yeah. brains can 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 uh, uh the, the absolutely fantastical process within our brains have evolved so that we can tell and, and tell apart it's called it's actually called chromatic discrimination um the these uh uh about two million colors and there, there are there are some other colors as well that, that there are there are things called invisible colors and there's things called imaginary colors within humans but that, that's all again that's a little bit of a um divergence away from this um what just going back to the the color thing so some people are colorblind uh, i don't know if you, you've heard of that you know colorblind people but what happens is that within their eyes they typically only have two different types of cone cells working so uh, um, if you think that to what a carp can see, we're colorblind to, to, to quite a lot. You know, it's equivalent of what a colorblind person would be to, to other people. Got it. I love the way you so, just asked me if, if I'd heard a colorblind before. <laughs> well, not that stupid. Are you colorblind? No, 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 no. I thought you asked okay. me if I've heard of colorblind Oh right, okay, okay, a, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, no, this it's, it's funny, I, and I appreciate the irony of talking about vision on a podcast. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Right, so 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 for carp fishing, I think, um, and because they can see so many more colours, um, there's no point in trying to match anything in carp fishing tackle to a lake bed or or anything. Um, yeah, there's no point in you just saying, "Oh, I've got some brown tubing and it's going to be brown on the bottom," because you don't know within that piece of brown tubing how much of yeah. it reflects near infrared light and how much of it reflects UV light. What, what, so, what about broke? Again, sorry to interject. What about broken up lines? Because what I try and do is I don't yes. really give a shit what yep. color things are, but I like different colors. So even I, I fish with braid if I if I can, um, and I'll use a marker pen and I'll just like I'll break up that outline for a good fifty yards. Right. 
Um, so, so two, the two that. things on that. Completely agree on the the um, uh, on breaking things up. So, so you know, if, you, if you've got a tackle box full of green kit for weedy waters and brown kit for for yeah black and silt and that sort of thing, what I would say is, you know, you don't have to. No, no, no one's been ripping you off in the tackle market, and you know that that sort of thing. I don't think that happens. So all I would say is just mix and match them up. You know, you know, just 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 break things up. But definitely disrupting outlines is how you camouflage things. Definitely, yeah. definitely with that. But um, yeah, so so they can see all these colours, and and um, you know, and, and another example would be that if you you went and bought um, you went to a tackle shop and you bought three yellow pop ups three tubs of yellow pop-ups from different manufacturers to you those are going to look like three you know they're, they're different manufacturers they've got some different ingredients in them um different dyes different flavors um to you you're going to see three yellow pop-ups to a carp they can be three completely different colors they, they, they can show three completely different dependent on the ingredients dependent on the dyes and etc but because the light's invisible to us we can't see and we can't tell. Mm. So, so, so I think it kind of goes against uh, um, what, you know, the, the phrase trust your own eyes is that when it comes to what a carp can see and what we can see, um, they can see a lot more and you, you can't trust what, what you're looking at is what they're looking at. Very, very interesting. I don't know yeah. if I'm jumping ahead slightly, but no, no, that's fine. <clears throat> I don't know where I've got this from. But are there certain things, um, I want to say spirulina, that would actually possess or probably should say reflect certain light waves that they can pick up on more effectively than others? Is, is that right? So, so the, the near, near infrared light, um, is and again, this is going quite deep, but it's quite reactive in the carbon hydrogen bond. So anything organic, anything that that's made, plastics, uh, uh, plants, uh, um, anything, yeah, and anything that's organic that's grown, anything that's been from life, will have a certain amount of near infrared reflection in it. Um, I got really excited when, when when I went and was looking into this. I I, um, I was like, oh, if it's in the carbon hydrogen bond, then you know that's in proteins and alcohols and these sort of things. And I got. I went and looked at when looked up near infrared um, in all of all of these carp ingredients that we use, and I'm like, they can see them. They, they they can you know, oh my god, we've got this so wrong. They can see amino acids is is the thing that I thought. Yeah. Um, and I um I actually wrote an email to Patrick Mills and said, I've got this theory. Is this right? And, and he was to to be fair to Patrick, you know, he's he's actually did his doctorate or, or you know professor um in mass spectrometry which uses near infrared light and he was like no 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 it's just when when they're, they're shining it from the other way and when they go and do mass spectrometry and look at um how things are composed of you know when you go down to to, to the microscopic level and what chemicals are in this and that they use near infrared light for that but that's so it's really useful but it's invisible to us uh, um so you know it doesn't bother us um so yeah so going back so in organic materials the other the other thing that is really near infrared fluorescent is chlorophyll in weed so if if you were to look at, uh, um, at any sort of plant green leaves and that sort of thing um marijuana. It, it, yeah, marijuana, uh, um it throws out a lot anything green anything in chlorophyll uh um would not appear that deep color to, to carp it appears uh, as a lot more near infrared within it as well um so again for the near infrared like within the spectrum and just going to to the weed thing uh, um what i was going to say was around what patrick had said to me was that it's actually that the, this light is going to be a lot more will appear as a lot more of a darker red as a really deep red uh, um to to the things that can see it um so that made me think of the deep reds that we use in fishing. So red fish meals from Robin Red and 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 those sorts of things. That deep red, um, the, those within Robin Red, you know, you got the is it ca carotenoids? Uh, uh, um, yeah, carotenoids. Yeah, carotenoids. I, so, I use them uh, in, in my baits. Yeah. Um, so so they are they will appear differently 
to to fish than than we think with that deep red there's probably going to be whether it's a bit more color or or you know, we'll see it as red they they will see that as a different color hmm. um but things like blabworm so blabworm are going to be and and, and you know, people talk about carp with their heads down in 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 big beds of silt uh um looking for blabworm and using their um you know, using chemo reception to find blood burn, um, you know, they're talking about the signals that they throw out. In fact, because of the near infrared light, um, and then being able to see it, A, they can see through cloudy water, B, that they can see the deep red. I think what's happening is that the fish are sticking their heads down in the silt, blowing it up, and they can seal the blood burn. Mm. So, so it's not, you know, maybe when we're, when we're putting so much into, into, um, you know, what are the signals that blood worm are giving off? Obviously, that's really important too, but I think we're forgetting that they can probably see them really well too. Interesting. Um, carotenoids, there's numerous ones out there, um, many of which not not really spoken about, but they're amongst some of the best things I've ever used. Now, right, and I've spoken about this recently in the bait club, so I don't which is a, okay. a, a, a subscription club. So I don't want to give it all away on here because it's not fair on the members. Right. But do you think that could possibly be, I mean, I have my, ther my theories about it, but do you think part of that could be due to the, the visual aspect of it or, or not? Uh, definitely for the, the visual aspects and what they can see. I think it, it, it I mean, the, the deep red is, is a proven carp catcher, isn't it? You know, the, 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 the carotenoids, one of the things about them, no matter what the science says, there is evidence that so many people have caught fish with robin red in. It, it, it's yeah, it definitely catches them. You know, it's it's that you don't uh, um, you know because of it, in spite of it. Either way, robin red's a good good addition to a carp bait. Um, a Hutchie actually wrote about about it really really early on in one of the first big carp magazines, um, and he talked about it. And what happened was he said like um, I think it's Car Carafil Red was uh was a canary dye and that was a um i'm not sure what uh uh carotenoids it's got in it but it was present in the original robin red but what happened was that people were they used robin red to to dye their birds and make their budgies pink and etc but people were taking it as a tanning agent and um what would happen is they'd end up with a build-up of it if they'd had if you have excess excessive uh, carotenoids it builds up behind your eyes um and you just end up with these big deposits and it makes you go blind so what they did was they had to move this particular one out of the food stream and that was you know that hutchie said at the time this is like back in 92 i think um you know it's, a, it's being taken out um some of the stuff that i've read on it as well is that carotenoid, carotenoids are are used in um they create a chemical called retinol, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, which is used within the the cells within your eyes. So, you know, I thought there was something there around that. You know, if you've got the robin red is being sent to the eyes uh, uh, within humans, then it's definitely useful, you know, possibly useful for 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 carp as well to help them see. It could be well, one I mean, of the foodstuffs that helps them see. Yeah, yeah, retinol is is basically just vitamin A which is essential. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So they've, um, so again, with this around the near infrared stuff is that, that there are um, other species. Uh, and when I say species like amphibians and, and, and birds and, um, and reptiles that, that have got these four cone cells in their eyes as well. Like mammals have just got the three uh, and they've done lots of, there's lots of research that they've gone and done on, on the amphibians and stuff as well. And, and they, I think I read in one article that they had a frog that was that would sit at night with um, part of his eye underwater, part of his eye above water, and yeah. the part of the eye that was above water, I think, could see near infrared light, and then the, the the part underneath didn't, or vice versa, or something like that. But but what it what it was saying was that it, it, the frog had enough control to to turn this on and off. Dependent on what it was looking at and those wow. sorts of things. That's amazing. So, yeah. So, to just going and, and again, just talking about the, the vision and what I said earlier on about them having better eyesight than us is that along with the stuff that um, I've done 
within carp fishing and, and reading this stuff up and, and that sort of thing is that um in my work i i do a lot of stuff and i work in data visualization uh, uh, you know taking information from a computer and putting it in a way that's as easy to understand as possible you know and that there's certain things you can do with charts and graphs and that sort of thing um that you can actually take advantage of of evolutionary uh, um behaviors within humans to help them understand it a bit more but and through through this and looking into this what what you be, realize is that um eyesight is so so important to to uh any sort of animal that has it uh, and again it goes back a little bit to to you know carp are, carp are thick and and you know carp carp is a good one was like a bit of bro science was carp um because vision is no good for for carp bait because carp can't see under their mouths when they're eating. Uh, and I was reading that and I was like, what, what was that? and I thought, when was the last time I could see under my mouth when I'm eating? You know, and, and and I know what vision means to me. And within the animal kingdom, I think there's like eighty percent of the animal kingdom have got some sort of of visual receptor. You know, they've got receptors that that. Um, can see light and it's really really important for them it's the difference between living and dying and and everything's evolved from however million years life is 3.7 billion years we've all continuously evolved over the years and we've all every iteration of us something's improving something's getting worse etc survival of the fittest it's just got better and better and better and to think that there is an animal on the earth with eyesight where that eyesight's not very good I think you know carp would probably be the only animal it, it, to to think that. So so anything that has an eyesight, it's really really good. We know as humans how good we are at seeing things, um, and our eyes have evolved for our, for our environment. Carp have lived underwater for for however many billions of years. I think common carp themselves are a, the actual species are a couple of million years old now. But you know they've they've evolved so that they can see within their environment and. We should definitely assume that they can see better in water than we can. Much better, much, much better. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, so some of the other bits that I, I thought of was, was just around like, like so you find out this information about the near infrared light and then and, and, and on the UV light, for example, and then I kind of go and look at how it applies to carp fishing and all those little things that you hear about or see in carp fishing or, or you know i wonder why that happens or i wonder wonder what it does that and um you know it might answer some of those things so definitely you know black seeds at night is is purely visual you know i think i think you know that, that's a, a way of catching them those black zigs in the upper layers that, that they that near infrared lights coming through the clouds coming from the moon and they're seeing these things in the water whether they see black foam as black is something completely different but but I think it kind of explains that 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 black rig, uh, um, those black zinks. Um, something else that I thought, and again, it relates to that that plastics and that organics is um, plastic baits. I know there's been a lot of a lot of talk and a lot of uh, uh, um, I think like Lee Jackson writes about it in Tim Paisley's book. He's got a whole chapter in in the 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 makeup of plastic baits and the solvents that are used. Um, within making them and you know is that is that what it is but um i think again i think it's purely visual i think you know within the the, the plastic there is something in there that that means that they can see them at night they can see them as a different color and uh, uh you know w with those it's lure fishing for them i, I think mean, you know th despite not knowing this you know people have caught carp for, for for decades and so so you know you know, we'd still do it. There's people out there that are absolutely amazing at it. They do really well. But you know, a lot of people talk about that little percentage, the little 10%, the little 2% yes. and that sort of thing. So hopefully, you know, maybe um, this will be useful for people in that way. And they can think, well, you know, I'm, I'm spending this time trying to blend this rig in so it looks perfect on the bottom and that sort of thing. But, you know, you can forget about that. Spend it time elsewhere. You know, you know. but there's a... Um, and around the colours and the blending things in, uh, um, there's a, there's an Einstein quote, and that it was around. Um, he was asked to to. I'm trying to think of what, what it was. But basically, he said he said if you if you don't know, it was about 
um, static points within the universe. You know, within our universe, there is no, there are no static points. So um, uh, where things are, like if things are moving towards each other or away from each other, it's 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 impossible to tell because there's no way to um, measure it physically. And he said, if you can't do that, then just forget about it. You know, there's no point in worrying about it. Just, just you know, if you can't get your head around it, don't worry about it. And I've kind of taken that approach because it is, as you've said, like it is a bit of a head fuck on it. Um, but, but you know, in turn, the stuff around nights, fishing at night, and the fact that they can see at night when we can't. Um, I don't know with, with some lamping if, if you can, you know, you you sometimes see people going out lamping at night and putting a bright light on fish and then not moving you know could, could that be because um the light that's been shone on them hasn't got any near infrared in it i don't know so presumably they can they can see obviously near infrared and uv but they can also see the light spectrums that we can see as well right yes so yes. why wouldn't they see um, the torch well, because as I said earlier on with the um, with the frog, there is a chance that they can turn it on and off. I've not seen a paper that says that yet. I've seen well, that. Why would they turn it off? Right. Because, uh, because that you know, for all we know, because for however many billions of years the Earth has been here, we've always had you know that the Earth is completely bathed in near infrared light. Twenty four hours a day that is. So during the day and during the night. Um, I think that the the thing on the frogs was that um, they turn it on. You know, possibly the receptors are, are, are stronger at that time of night. Yeah. Um, we have we have rods. So so within our eye, we have um, the cells. So we, we have cone cells which see color, and then rods which see intensity. Yeah, and and we actually within humans actually switch between them we we can switch between them without knowing really? and yeah so you know when when you wake up in the morning or, or last thing at night you know when as carp anglers we'll, we'll know this before dawn everything's kind of a, a, a before the color comes into the day you know you know as things get lighter there's a lot of bluey kind of a bluey color for us do you ever know that do you ever notice that i know what you mean like in the real yeah yeah it's called the uh a Perkinji effect it was named after a Swedish uh, um, doctor uh, uh, and he um, he noticed it and, and what it is is this this period in really low light levels um, within our eyes we switch to um, using rods over over the cones at the back we kind of turn them off ourselves so I always presumed the cones and the rods within the eye worked in unison so for example if you grip something in your hand you're not just using your hand muscles but you're using your forearm muscles i thought it right. was the same kind of thing as that but it's obviously not right but but at times you don't need them you know at times at times you don't want to be spending energy on 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 using you know the cone yeah. cells you probably want to be spending you know all those signals and the, the stuff coming from the the rods is more important you're right yeah sure there's there's uh, just going back to the like within the eyes and, and the human body uh, and just the natural world and the things that we do consciously subconsciously uh, uh, mainly subconsciously is absolutely astounding if you take the the actual science around a human body and and as a as a bunch of chemicals or a bunch of proteins and and, and how we we act and what we do and to, to live every day it's phenomenal absolutely phenomenal with all these things that are going on that we don't know about yeah there's this is the thing there is so much we don't know um yeah now yeah I, I would have presumed that there was not much data out there on the vision of carp but i mean it's sounding like that that definitely isn't the case do you um so so that there's a there's a few there's a lot of um there's a lot of data on vision of cold uh, goldfish uh and what they 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 seem to like doing uh, um, fish and stuff on goldfish. I think, you know, they're a pre pretty hardy fish, very, very closely related to carp. Um, um, and they just know a lot more about them. They do a lot of testing on goldfish that they will eventually go on to do on humans as well. Yeah. And th and that's where these, these um, the stuff around them being able to see different colours to us, that's where... Um, that, that's where it come from, the goldfish testing. So the, what they did within the goldfish tests was that they did these different different shades of yellow. So there, there would be 
to us, they would look like three squares of yellow or three, three different pop-ups. And then what they did was they trained them over time to associate them with food. Um, and dependent on which yellow was showing, you know, they would go to the food on that one. It's a bit, actually, that the, the previous talk you did with John Llewellyn, and he talked about the um, the fish and the feeders with the carbohydrates and the proteins and, and yeah. fat yeah. feeding. So if you go and look at that paper and go go and read that, one of the things that they did was that they, um, on the different fish, they kept changing the different colors of the feeders because they, the evidence was out there that the fish could tell different colors and, and they were worried that they'd be trained to, to go to those feeders. So they switched them all around. Yeah, yeah. So it couldn't go down to that. It was actually down to, to the... The, the, yeah, but but I mean the that, content of the food. Yeah, but that would be just basic color recognition, wouldn't it? Yep. Yeah. There's nothing basic with color recognition, though. Like I say, that, well, that, no, I. Yeah, I know what you when mean. you when you really really dig into it. There's not. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating, and like I say I go into wormholes. You know, there'll be one one night, and I'll go into to uh, yeah, just go and spend half an hour reading about near infrared light underwater, and and or near infrared light. One of the things I did with it, as soon as I found out about it, was, oh, you know, I want to go and start looking at things in near infrared light. Let's go and see what a rig looks like. Let's go and see what baits look like under near infrared light. So um, there is quite a thing for near infrared photography. You can go and, and get different lenses that go and fit on the front of the camera. Um, a lot of night photography, you see the night vision goggles. Um, and, and I went and sort of started looking into that. But But what you've got to realize with that is that whatever's taken the picture. So, so whether it's a night vision goggles or, or your camera adjusts that light so that it puts it in a way that we can see it. So it might be really, really, really dark red. And then in a, in a picture, what they'll do is turn it to white. So, so you can look at a near infrared photography and there's all these trees and all these great colors, but all they're doing is showing you what it would look like if it was black and white. So they take all the color out of it. Yeah, but the the thing is, the carp aren't just viewing it in infrared, are they? They're viewing it exactly. In, exactly. infrared, near infrared, UV. Yeah, so they're, they're looking at it all. So it's like another color of light added to it. And that's exactly right. So yeah. you can find out from the near infrared photography where what is uh, transmitted, you know, what's reflecting the near infrared light that's giving it off and, and carp will be able to see it, but not exactly as a carp would see it. I think it all makes um, sense. I, I think I'm presuming it's more complex than it is it's actually not as as are many things it's actually not super complex is it once you get the general comprehension of it yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. it's you know it's the, the yeah absolutely one of the other things that i'm suspicious of uh um with it and as well it's more around how light um reacts you know when when we see we see how it goes a little bit back to what I said around the, the for our environment and we can see within our environment. So there, there are certain things that we can do. And, and I think a good example is Polaroids. You know, you put on a pair of Polaroids um, and it helps you see into the water. Yeah. So when mm -hmm. you put them on, you can suddenly see through the surface of the water. Um, and what that is, that's, you know, that's not related to color. That's more related to reflection and refraction, um, which is how light behaves in water. Um, when it, moves around substances or that sort of thing. You know, it's a completely different medium. Um, and I'm suspicious that um, the carp can see oils or see a certain amount of oils. So, so yeah. if, you, if you've if you got um, uh, a very, very oily bait that's kicking off uh, um, oils from the bottom, I'm suspicious that fish can see that. So so that they, they uh, it clouds water up or, or, or you know, there's something about it um where they're just like okay that's it's not clear that we can see there is something there i suspect it's, they see it cloudy yeah m many people have mentioned this haven't they over the years i always kind of chalked it up to the fact of uh, kind of light refraction from the oil right yeah um i mean i'm, I'm completely guessing <laughs> you know i'm not uh absolutely uh, absolutely well but... the thing that the thing that made me suspicious of it is a couple of things so one of them is that um there's quite a thing for WD-40 on lures. Yeah. There, there's a, you know spraying oils on lures and that sort of thing um, and catching more fish with that. So the, the, the scientific papers talk about predatory fish and, and how it changes with them as, as well. Um, 
but they they said that they can see it, and and I'm suspicious about that because, you know, I think predatory fish are a lot more. We think of them when fishing for them as a lot more sight based, rather than than, than uh, uh, making complex boilies and that sort of thing. The other thing was that uh, I remember years ago fishing a, a pit um, with really high oil trout pellets, and I I started a day off and put all of these these pellets in and we'd walk around the pit and, and as the day went on and what i noticed as we got into the afternoon when the pellets were breaking down was that they had these sort of shoals of of silvers would be in columns above the trout pellets um coming off the bottom it'd be like completely open water and yeah you know, nothing else around and they'd be there and and just hanging still like that in the water i i, I suspect suspect the only other times i've seen that is when they're undercover and when they're you know under boats or or under pontoons or under jetties where they feel feel, safe yeah you you feel that they feel that there is this kind of protective layer around them because they can't they can't they can't be seen so so you know where i where i said that the um near infrared light you can see through clouds um I think maybe with UV light, it, it can't see through oil, so it makes it cloudy. So, you know, there's like the slightly different properties and the actual physics behind it uh, yeah. um, reacts differently in different ways. Makes perfect sense. I would have cut that down to the oil floating up in the water column, little food particles, they're there sampling it. Right. I mean, I, I was suspicious of that, but, but um, I mean, it could possibly be that. It's just the only time I've ever seen this before was, you know, like, on dive boats or 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 um under jetties and that sort of thing no, it's it, very interesting maybe it is maybe it's not you know it, it, yeah, it's yeah. it's uh you know uh, i think the uh, uh, circumstantial evidence is still evidence so you know there's lo- lots of things that you hear about and you're like oh could it be that could it be that uh, um but uh uh yeah we could both be right you know yeah 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 no i'm 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 not saying that i'm right <laughs> and yeah. i'm not saying that you're yeah, right. yeah 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 throwing it out there yeah um yeah what, what do you how do you feel about the um the do you remember the glow in the dark corns by uh enterprise right. people, frank warwick yep 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 what are your thoughts on those um i, I think there's something to them i mean I, I think with with the colors as well and i think it might go back a little bit to to the, them being able to turn it on and off again is that um there's definitely days sort of with within my own fishing where a change of color makes a difference. You know what? One day yeah. you can you can have um, uh, you can have one bait that works really well, one color, and then another day it'll be something else. So I am very suspicious of that. And and I remember years ago, I think it was um, a guy called Chris Berry um, was was fishing. Uh, it was an article in Carp Talk where he was fishing the the Thames with Crowy, and um, I think he used something like forty or fifty different hook baits during the day. Just, just like every 20 minutes he would wow. change things over and try another one and try another one and try another one and um he caught one in the end you know it was no one else around him had done anything at all but he finally caught one um and i've definitely had days when i've been watching fish feeding in the edge with a bait and 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 uh um you know not being able to catch anything at all and then changing a hook bait and just changing the different color of a hook bait means that i suddenly start getting bites I've had that. I've had that plenty of times. I actually had a, a, a and I think white is is a good one for that. It's always a good, good go-to color. Um, one spring a few years ago, here we had some fish that were were in a, in an area of Lake Ontario that um, it gets very cold in the winter, and the fish shut down here. You know, that they, they will go out to wherever and 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 sit on the bottom. And it was just this one area where we could see a few fish on the bottom. Um, and we went down. It was early on in the spring. Chuck some bait in, um, and I used my one rod. It was one rod at the time with a, with a white um, piece of white plastic corn on it. And we probably watched these fish for six hours, and and they 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 come up and were slow and moving around backwards and forwards. And in those six hours, they picked up one I think one piece of food off the bottom or one item off the bottom, and uh, it was my white hook bait. Like and all that time, so definitely something on the color there that that making things stand out. That uh, there is a, a theory that, works. yeah, the white dye titanium dioxide is supposedly attractive to carp as well. So, so, so today, before I came on this call, I went on to 
um, look at the Science Direct to get you that number about the, the, the number of papers. There was a paper on there that came up that said titanium dioxide is actually toxic to them. Mm. Uh, and, yeah, um, it is. It's getting bad. Yeah. It's banned over here. Oh, is it? I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. I thought it was yeah, still yeah. used in, in some of those white dyes. But um, it was a paper on nanotechnology and, and, and seeing how um, the nanoparticles and stuff would react together. And they said combined with something else. It said it, it was... It was toxic to carp and combined with something else made it even worse. I think it was combined with silver nanoparticles or something yeah. like that made it made it even worse to them. Yeah. It, it, people who have been using uh, my polar fruit hook baits for a while will notice they're not quite as white as they, as they used to be. Um, right. It's because I've dropped the titanium dioxide. I know they're not eating the pop-up, but still. Um, right. So, yeah, 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 I, I was aware of that. Um, yeah, there's still. I, mean, I think there's still plenty of baits out there, and people that will be putting white baits out. You know, of in, course, in the and, and stuff. Yeah, of course. yeah, of course. I, I'm over the top on that stuff, but you know, I'd rather be that way. Um, um, so the other stuff I, I've got a little list of. You know, you said around for the stuff for for the fishing and and those sorts of things. Um, red laser pens that we use for scaring tufties. Um, I I they're horrific at scaring tuff, tufties. I, I don't know how. Other people have found, but I think they will scare the shit out of the fish as well. Mm. They will definitely I just, see, you know. I, I mean, I think any time <laughs> there's birds, all of a sudden, absolutely fucking shit themselves. Excuse my language. Uh, th th just that alone is going to spook the carp. I don't use them. Right, right. You know, it's it's it's, um, it, it's a learnt behaviour. They are herd animals. They're tuned into reacting to other fish and also other animals what's going on around them i think if you've right. got birds diving on a spot and there's carp there as well all of a sudden the birds are absolutely crapping themselves the carp right. you know definitely pick up on that so i'm not one for those anyway right but yeah um, talking, I mean, of, talking of the birds actually you know this was good you know your question earlier on about um how much can they see on the bottom and how, mm. how much can fish see on the bottom so i don't know about you but i've definitely had I've definitely been tufted out in like 20 foot of water in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, def definitely been occasions when, when I've had birds diving on me right in the middle of the night as well. And birds are tetrachromatic. So, you know, when, when they're going down to the bottom and they're finding your, your baits in the middle of the night, then the odds are that's the reason why they can find them. Tetrachromatic. You know, the diving. Meaning? Uh, that's the, the number of cones in their eyes. They've got four, oh, four cones we're, instead of three. We're, we're three. Polychromatic. Uh, uh, trichromatic. Trichromatic, not poly? Yeah, we have three. What's polychromatic? No. I don't know. Right. Oh, so I'll tell you what, actually, polychromatic, I think, refers to... There are occasionally people that claim to have four um, four different types of cone cells in their eyes. There's a woman uh, in Australia who, who, who claims to have it, and they've done tests on her, and again using different colored yellows and stuff that she she can see different yellows to us and they're called polychromatic people it's kind of like a, a really really rare really really rare um more likely to be in women than men but um i think that could be what it is okay interesting so maybe that's what it is we need this 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 australian woman to come and check our rigs out and tell us what's right and what's wrong yeah yeah absolutely so, so you, sorry, just to backtrack quickly, you were saying yeah. about um, your white hook baits doing well. Um, yeah. I've always, and I've mentioned this numerous times on the podcast about, you know, quote unquote, bright hook baits. Um, I fish gravel pits, mostly fishing gravel pits in the Cotswolds at the moment. Um, very kind of gravelly, yellowy, sandy type substrate. A, you know, what we would class as a bright yellow hook bait will pop up over that not very well contrasted yet you chuck in a dark fish meal it stands out so much more than that you know quote unquote bright yellow hook bait because of the right. contrast so i've sure. always viewed i've always viewed it like that and if i want a really bright one you know perhaps i'll chuck a really dark bait over over the um the gravel am i completely wrong <laughs> because my eyesight is so limited compared to a carp's or do you think so i would something there yeah, I would say that there probably is something there on that. You know, and again, this comes to what you talk about, the disruption and the contrast. There's definitely something there. But but you have to remember that because, you know, you might think of it as a really dark red. Uh, um, and, and 
the substrate for all we know as well like you don't know what's coming out what the uv and and um the the uh, infrared near infrared that the bottom's kicking out so um it could you know you just said it looks brown to you for all we know it could be like day glow pink and then you've gone and chucked out something would it that, would that, it be that, that extreme drop. though it wouldn't be that extreme surely it could be Really? Honestly, it could be, and and, and the, the way that the the um, let's say this discrimination works is is it could be, you know, it's the difference between seeing something bright red and bright blue, and the green in between. Really, because that's so, yeah, yeah. You so what blue. what I think? Uh, sorry, go on. So uh, you mentioned blue. I've always thought blue is one of those pigments that's not really found in nature. I know you can find some purples, but never blue. Um, Absolutely, that's right. right. You know, and, and blue was, to me, was... blue to me is not blue to a carp, is it? No, no. 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 Blue, blue is. It. You were saying that around in nature, yeah. Blue dyes. There, there was a. There was a. Um, it's actually one of those things where your kids catch you out on something, and um, there was a theory that we'd not like. I, Blue was only a new color to humans within the last thousand years or so, because in really old pictures, um, blue's not there. You know, it's really, really hard to, to uh, oh, wow. find blue in any of those pictures. But it turned out because it was so hard to find within nature um, that that they just weren't using them. And, and blue, blue dyes were really, really expensive to use. So you'll see it in the Sistine Chapel and those sorts of things. There'll be blues within that, but you, you know, your 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 constables and and the old English guys who's just a guy that lived in a small house in Norfolk or whatever. There's not going to be much blue in his paintings because he couldn't afford that, that blue dye. Interesting. Um, yeah, and I think it changed. They found there's a certain something in some cabbage or, or, or there's a type of cabbage or plant. My daughter came in and told me this. She was just like, yeah, it's this <laughs> this plant they discovered and then blue started appearing and everything. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So so like, like I say, it, it, it's, I'm not, I'm not, I think the, 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 the one thing, I did, I did an article on this for the Canadian Carp Society uh, um, a year ago, and um, some of my friends were talking to me, and they were just like, oh, you know, this is the, the tackle shops are ripping us off. They know about this. Well, I'm not sure they do. You know, I, I, I would never, never think that they are by selling us all this tackle to blend in the bottom when it doesn't or anything like that. No. I, I've seen enough of, of, of you know, the likes of Danny and, 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 uh, and, and those guys, and I really do think that everything that they put out is to try and help catch fish. But um, I think that we, we are still, you know, we're catching in, in spite of this, not because of it. Uh, um, especially anything, matching anything green, like to weed. Yeah. Just forget it. You know, you know it, it, it's because of that chlorophyll and because it's, so chlorophyll is, is luminous in, in near infrared light. It's got, it's that, that strong. Um, but fish it completely, completely different to us. No, Danny, you're wasting your time if you're listening. Ha! <laughs> well, I say, just mix it up, break it up, disrupt it, and, and, and yeah, just, you know, all the that's, that's the way I've contrast. always, well, not always, but for many years, that's the way I've seen it. I mean, it's, I'll happily use like a little bit of black or something. I mean, because how many black twigs and bits of detritus are on the lake bed anyway? You know, it's, it's sure, not, it's, it's sure. Nothing I mean, unusual for them, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, I've always find that, uh, um, that, yeah, the twigs and branches and, and all those sorts of things that you see on the bottom. Um, being able to tell the difference between that and a um, a hook link or, or a piece of plastic tubing or, or that sort of thing. You know, Actually. Uh, uh, it's very, very hard to tell. However, okay. you now have to think in your mind, for all you know, your your plastic tubing could be a shade of purple to the fish. Yeah, yeah. And we would never know. Did you remember the, I think it was Solar did it. It was, um, I think it was called Weed Effect. Yeah. And it, it was this stuff that you could kind of splice around your your lead core or yeah. your hook length. Yeah. Hook length. Um, I went for a phase of uh, when I was just doing absolutely every slight little thing I could to catch more carp. I was doing a lot of fishing back then. Um, I used that for a while and I liked it. Um, did it make a difference? Do, do you think that it actually made a difference on your catches? I don't know, in all honesty. It, 
at the time I was I was fishing so much and so hard like I don't I was I was really consistent anyway um just because purely because of the amount of time I was spending at the lake so I don't really know I, I don't remember thinking this is an absolute game changer but right. <clears throat> if I had the slightest inclination that it would make a difference I would do it back in those days um right. and I also like the 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 idea that Perhaps when they sucked in the bait, and again, I probably overthought things uh, to a large degree back then. But when they sucked in the bait, if they did get some of that hook length on their on their lips, which are very sensitive, um, they're very hard, but they're also very sensitive from carp. That it wouldn't feel like what they would normally feel when they sucked in a bait, because they'd normally feel like right. the rigidity. And I like I remember liking the idea of that. But look, whether it made a difference or not, I don't know. I certainly don't remember yeah. thinking this is a fucking game changer. Right. I definitely did it anyway, <laughs> for a while at least. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know what? If it if it it's like all those little percentages, isn't it? You know, if yeah, if, yeah. if if there was occasions there it did make that difference, then cool. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean I know you said that did it hasn't necessarily changed your fishing that much other than you've perhaps relaxed a little bit about you know rig camouflage yeah um, rig camouflage and the other thing was was trying trying different colored hook baits oh uh, so, yes so going, of course yeah and yeah. trying a lot more different colors and and you know we, we've had our our rules have changed here a couple of years ago where we could only fish with one rod for a long time um and then they changed the rules so we can fish with three now for tourism right um and uh so now i've always got three different three different color baits on three different types of baits you know even if they're three different yellows or or, or whatever but definitely chopping and changing on those during the day and and th there are definitely days where one will catch more than others um uh, i said I like orange through the summer for, for some reason uh um tooty pop-ups um through the, the the summer months especially on the st lawrence river um amazing you, you they'll outfish other rods 10 to 1 now is that because they're orange? You know, I think a lot of bright pop-ups it is. It could be the the flavors as well, but but they're killer bait. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I fish with one rod probably more often than not these days. <laughs> Out of choice, um, but yeah, I know it's not in vogue. So as I was just going to say, I know I know you said it hasn't necessarily changed your angling that much, but if you were to really think about this. And you were to, someone would say to you, look, how could you use this information that you now know to outwit more carp, to catch more carp? What, if you were to really think about it, where do you see the potential to use this in our favor? Um, I, I think it, it, it's more not being distracted by other stuff and not right. being distracted distracted by the stuff where you're just like oh it's all because of that color and because they can right. see this and because they can see that and that sort of yeah. thing and and you know you know not not just because the water's cloudy sort of walking around and showing yourself to the the skyline and 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 you know showing yourself off a bit more like like just be aware that carp can see really 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 well and, and you know if you're if you're trying to be sneaky and you're moving up on fish and, and that sort of thing um you know, just be a lot more cautious of it. Be a lot more aware of it. We, to a certain extent, we do that anyway. You know, it's it, uh, the motion and the hiding behind trees. That that's right. But just pay a little bit more attention to that. Um, the 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 other stuff definitely around weed. You know, you know, casting out bright yellow singles into weed and and that sort of thing. That probably is not going to be giving you the 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 standout that you think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, any anything around weed. Um, you know, you might think that again. You talk about the contrast and the colours and stuff. Thinking that something looks really dark to a fish is probably going to be looking really, really light, really, really bright in that colour. And it's not green, which is crazy. If you think about um, silkweed and those sorts of things, you know, it, it, it's not. It's not what you think it is. That bright yellow one there is going to be appearing very, very differently. Interesting. And then. And then the other thing is the 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 fishing at night and just just you know think thinking um I know I know and I've I've definitely heard of people doing this before is that they um will switch over from highly visual baits 
um, during the day and then food baits at night. That might not necessarily always be the case. You know, you know, it, it, it's a, 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 um, it, the bright baits could be really pumping out at night as well from that near infrared. And the fact that they can see around, they can see something around them, you know, and they're going to be able to see something around them pretty well because it's there all the time. Even even on 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 those, you know, the nights where there's no moon. I don't know if you've done been traveling anywhere, but um, you know, if you go where there's no light pollution around, just under stars on a clear light, you can still see quite a lot. You know, it's still fairly bright, and you can still see things around you. Um, that's, and you just got to remember that, yeah. yeah, they do that all the time, all the time. That's been most of my fishing um, up and certainly up until I moved up to back up to the Cotswolds when I was in Cornwall, you know, very little light pollution, if any at all. Right. Uh, for actually zero light pollution on many waters. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. I remember there was a, there was a comet oh, 10, 15 years ago. I think it was something probably, probably closer to 20 years ago. Now there was, a, if you remember, there was a comet coming over and, and you could see it in the sky. And I remember seeing it in London. I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't Halley's comet. It was one that w- was around for a while. And, um, yeah, I remember coming down to Devon. We'd seen it in London, and it would appear like this little, you know, an inch long in the sky and this tiny little thing, and it's not that impressive. Came down to Devon, and it was like a just massive white streak across the sky up Do above. You know, it looked absolutely phenomenal. That's so funny. I think I fished during that comment. That's so funny you say that. I don't know if right. it's the same one. I can't imagine there's right. been many in the last 20-odd years, is there? No. Um, yeah, I'm sure I fished with that. It was a very interesting you say. It. I, in fact, I think I've got a diary entry of that. Um, right. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but it was it was. I'd say it was really, really impressive. It was appeared. In yeah. A, I'm just trying to think of where I was. I was I was sort of North Devon, and it was in the northern sky there. Yeah. I will. I would have been fishing in Cornwall at the time. Well, actually, I might have been fishing in Devon because I I lived in Cornwall, but I later years I I fished in Devon a bit before moving back up here to the Cotswolds. But yeah, interesting. Um, sorry, just to go back a little bit, you mentioned about weed, uh, throwing things in weed. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's, I like fishing in weed. I've spoken about this a lot, so I won't bore people again with it, but I also think I try and blend things in because in my head, quite possibly wrong, but when you switch off certain stimulus, so let's say visual, you almost heighten the other stimuli. So right. in my head, let, let's put it this way. And it's probably, in all honesty, doesn't happen like this because you've just dropped the bombshell that carp see a whole load of shit we don't. But let's say it's swimming over a weed bed, um, thick weed bed, and all of a sudden it can't see anything, but boom, there's these this you know, chemical or food signal pumping out. Right. In my head, that would be much more alluring to a carp because it can't see it so it they're very inquisitive creatures in in my firm opinion so what is that can't see it i want to go and explore that i want to find out where it is and then i want to figure it out which generally that means taking it into their mouth cavity compared to oh yeah i know what that food signal is i can see it standing out like a fucking sore thumb they might not be as interested in it now this is really deep thinking quite possibly overthinking but that's the way I kind of view that. Does that make sense to you? Oh, it totally makes sense. And Could be totally fucking wrong uh, though, because by the no, sound, no, 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 but, see but, so much more. But, so I think you know that there, there is definitely the thing within carp fishing where we, um, and I never get this word, where we is it anth- anthomor- anthropomorphism, where we anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize, you know, where we go and and try and put human ideas on 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 uh, on fish, uh, yeah. uh, you know whether they're reading stuff or that sort of thing. I think that, you know, a lot of that is done too much. However, when it comes down to basic instinctual stuff, um, I think you can say, what what would we do as humans? And it's smell, you know, it's smell and taste. And, and you know, if you're walking through, uh, um, you know, if you're walking through a shopping center or whatever, you can smell where the food comes from and that sort of thing. And I'm pretty sure that the carp can do that too. Uh, uh, um, and, and oh, yeah. to a much much better extent that we that we can. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but but yeah, I think I think the other thing about weed as well, and fishing in weed, is that you you the weed is going to restrict the sight to the bait. Yeah. 
you know if you're fishing right into the middle of it you're right it's on the bottom and in that case the fish can't see it uh, um, because there's lots of leaf and foliage in the way. So in that case, you definitely need some flavor. You need some scent to pull them down. Once they get down close up and once they're next to it, they'll be using you know the vision as much as anything else. I think I think you misunderstood me. Um, I probably okay. said it wrong because I've had quite a few beers at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I mean is, I, I so I regularly fish in weed. I'll, I'll throw a, right. either a hinge I'll happily fish a hinge in deep weed or a, a, a chod rig. And I like to try and have that hook bait muted so it kind of blends in with the weed. Now, I fish over a lot of Canadian things like that, which isn't, it's right. not just one monotone color. Um, right. My thought process being, I don't want a bright one in there because that really stands out to the carp. I don't want it to stand out to the carp. I want it to blend okay. in. It was it. So I have it right up the line, or maybe a, a running. Gotcha. Job. So it's sitting on top of it. Yeah. Sits so it wouldn't on be, top it wouldn't be right it, down at the bottom, but yeah. doesn't really scream out visually. And I like that because in my head, the carp are picking up on the um, the 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 smell or the taste, the gustatory and and olfactory response of it. Right. And but they but they they're like, well, what is that? And they have to go and kind of explore it a little bit. Um, right. Does that make sense? It does make sense, but I think with near infrared light and UV it's just, light, it's not happening like it's that, just, is it? It's not happening like that. No, and, and we don't know. You know, we can't tell. We don't know um, because, yeah, because of the, the the the. As I said, that's it's the difference between two million colors and fifty million colors. So whereas well, you're going to see things blending in, you know, they they could be seeing, you know, the, that woman that. That, that Australian woman actually talks about cut grass and she says like where whereas people see cut grass and they'll go and look at a field of cut grass as all green she sees it as completely different colors you know like completely all over the place and, and lots of different colors with it as well wow but yeah so sort of going back to the the, the trying to match something's color to to the fishing environment or or anything like that just waste um, of time waste of time yeah I, you were saying about the the uh, the drinks. I, if you don't mind, could we just have a quick wee break? Go for it. Come back in a second. Lovely. Go for it. I will. I'll just sort of reiterate to the listener Lovely. what what I meant by that. But you you head off and let us know when you're back. I'll do a little monologue for you. <laughs> so I've spoken about this a lot on the podcast, and um, I like fishing. I like baiting up a spot, which will you know generally be. Some at least somewhat clear of weed. Um, I will bait that spot if I have the opportunity to pre-bait on it. That's fantastic. If I don't, that's also not an issue. But I will have my bait on that spot, and then I will fish my hook bait off of that spot, but in the weed. Bearing in mind, I fish very weedy venues, and there's far more weed coverage than there are clear spots by a long shot. So I'll I'll have my hook bait. Um, on a a little i do a little funky rig which is i guess the nearest thing to it would be a hinge a, a hinge rig um, but i'll also use a, a chod rig if need be i'll have i'll have that positioned in an area where i think the cart will peel in or peel off from that they'll, they'll come in and out on um and i've had so much success from that it is unreal and i don't mind sharing that with you i've then kind of like gone on from that to say well look i really want to kind of single out the the harder to catch carp and in my head that has involved not having such a standout bright bait um that's going to get picked up you know by the the perhaps younger more eager quickly swimming more agitated carp but it's going to get picked up by the the kind of slightly more slower wily carp this is just in my head is uh look you could you could come up with many arguments against what i'm saying i understand that so i've gone for a more kind of muted hook bait which i feel in my head blends into the weed much more efficiently the idea being it doesn't stand out visually to the carp um and and perhaps you know if an old carp you know with potentially more sensitive apparatus as we've spoken about with john llewellyn and i've been doing this way before that that episode by the way um if it does come across that and it detects it it's kind of like oh what's that where is that food signal coming from go sample it move you know food in the mouth etc and then it's too late for the car that's the, the the form of thinking that i've been subscribing to um obviously having spoken to james today 
probably complete bullshit um, because obviously what he's saying is that hook bait will actually just because it looks very similar color to my eye it's probably far from it to the actual carp's eye um, it's probably much different from what we perceive it to be um so you know that kind of uh, throws I'm my idea back. are you james uh, Hello, I was I was saying, that that, yeah. that that throws my idea out of the window um and it's obviously incorrect but um yeah nonetheless it's interesting uh, uh, and i will say so that i wouldn't I say so just listen to what you were saying though sam i wouldn't say yeah. it's incorrect you know you know you you've had results doing that so you know that there, there are you know Again, the circumstantial evidence is still evidence. You know, you you've done it. Well, you, it works. It works, and and in your head, you've come up with why it works in that way, and and you know, right. and that's what makes it all fun, isn't it? Is, oh, is the, of course. The looking at looking at all the 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 little bits of information and, and and all these things, and 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 trying to come up with it, and trying to crack the code, and and yeah. you know, that's what we we do with bait and uh, uh, through through uh, um, through taste and smell. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's all, all fascinating. One of the the other things I was going to say about when you were talking about the muted colours as well, and and fish not reacting is there's loads of stories about fish spooking off beds of sweet corn and that sort of thing, and and it made me think about yellow baits um, mm. and why yellow baits are the ones that always seem to catch. And um, when when well, one of my theories on this is that it's it's the colour that's sort of smack bang in the middle of it all. So if you were to look at that rainbow of of of, of colours and uh, um, with uh, the UV at one end and then the you know the near infrared violet as you go through, yellow is smack bang in, in the middle of all those colours. So I think um, it's probably going to be one of the easiest ones for us to see. For us you to know, see. You know, well, for, for for creatures to see, animals to see. Uh, um, yeah, because hmm. of that. I mean. For, for, we don't actually have um, receptors in our eyes to see yellow. So we don't, you know, if you were to just shine, uh, um, they've done all sort of tests on the cone cells in human eyes and that sort of thing. But we we react, the, the, the cones, if you look at a graph on, on the reaction and stuff, the peaks are, are on the blue, the, the red uh, um, and the green. Even though if you were to mix up, you know, if you were going to get some paint and you would mix blue and yellow together to get green, the, and this is this is a this is a, the head fuck. When with, with yellow light, it's actually red and green light mixed together, and it, it's our perception of that red and green light together. It's our the mixture of all of the rest of the stuff that gives us yellow. So you say it's, it's completely it's, made up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. Right. But you say it's going to be the easiest for us to see but surely it's to do with the contrast so i'm in a room right now the walls are magnolia a yellow pop-up next to that is not going to stand out as much as a brown pop-up next to that surely it's the contrast that matters right but yellow is a bright color and yellow is a light color which means typically it's easiest for us to see you notice things that are yellow more than than you know we do it, yellow, yellow baits and yellow pop-ups. You you are going to notice against most other backgrounds, yellow will stand out more yeah, than most okay. other colours. Okay. And I think that that's, I say, it's because it's the one right in the middle. It's it sits in the middle of that visual the the the, the visual spectrum of light, uh, and that's the reason. I, yeah, I think it stands out. Now, what what that yellow, uh, what the dyes have been used for that yellow, it might appear as as um, different colours, but uh, um, but you know. I think it's it's a pretty safe one. It's a pretty good one for that. Mm. There's, um, I think we were talking earlier on about there's actually impossible colours. So um, and these are colours that we can't see. So it's like when when you blend the different types of light together, there there are certain so the, the contrast hues brightnesses of when you mix the red, blue, and green lights together, where there's nothing at all, and our brains just completely ignore it. So we we kind of see a grey. Rather than, than 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 anything of any color, um, and there's there's some interesting sort of maps on on that as well. When you start looking in the vision around what we can see with our eyes and, and what we can't. Why do you, it's completely non fishing related, but yeah. obviously for for many years, many people have kind of viewed carp as actually they're quite kind of thick, not that particularly right. intelligent creatures. 
can't see that much. Yes, they can, you know, they can they, they can smell a lot, but not really as advanced as us. Why do you think <laughs> the more we dive into science, the more we realize pretty much all animals are significantly more advanced in us in all areas other well, than, you know, the obvious human traits? So so I think I wouldn't say that there, there are certain things that they're going to be better at. Yeah. Uh, and there's certain things they're going to be worse at. But I think when it comes down to adding it all together, what you've got to do is look at it and say, they're the same as us. So yeah. if you, you add all of our senses together, you know, we, you talk about the sight, the, 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 the uh, um, sound, smell, taste, balance, add them all up together. And that means that as a life form, we are still on Earth after 3.7 billion years. And so is a carp. And, you know, with survival of the fittest, we're all here. We, we've all got something mm. about us that means that we're, we're still alive. We're still evolving, and, and, you know, and life will move on from us. So to, to think that, that like, there is that thing around, yeah, they're stupid and, and, and um, that sort of thing. But when you look at the size of animals, uh, um, the the... the Better to cut. They've got small brains. As you, you know, people will say, you know, they've got a tiny brain, and therefore that they don't, um, they're not going to be as as clever as us. But instinctually, they are. You know, I think what puts humans different is that we we think about thinking. Mm. So we're here having a conversation about what we think about and those sorts of things as well. Whereas when it comes down to instinctual behaviours, so being able to 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 recognize what a food is being record you know being able to recognize what danger is what being able to, to recognize what safety is you know that they're all things that are are, are typically very instinctual uh, uh you know in, in inherent intelligence uh, um but um we're the same as them you know they're, they're not going to be able to read a book they're not going to be able to, to to but they can certainly learn and i i would you know i think as a as an animal uh, um, going back to the brain thing, so brain brain weight and size is proportional to your body size. So as you get bigger, typically as you get bigger, uh, your brain will usually usually grow as well. Um, uh, yeah. So so uh, something else that I'd seen with this too, and it's like slightly divergent, is that um, in evolution they think sight came before brains, uh, and the reason for that is that there's no point about thinking about things you can't see. Now say that so again. So, sight so, 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 brain. So, so being able to detect light, um, evolutionary. Uh, I've got I've got a note somewhere about how far. I think it's six hundred and fifty million years. So it's like way before the dinosaurs um, is the first fossils of where that they could see where there was evidence of um, being able to identify light in some way. First right. eyes, that sort of thing. Um, but when it comes down to the evidence of life forms having brains, it was a certain number of millions of years later when brains first came in. So I saw, you know, it, it's that important that, that um, it's been around longer. It's a very, very primal sense. Mm. Again, diverging, diverging back to around how smart a carp. Um, and again, the brain size with, with, with um, animal size, I think, you know, the equivalent... You, as smart as a dog, you know, there's some things that are, are dogs, dogs aren't going to be able to do, you know, you know, it's like, oh, my dog's the smartest dog in the world. He can do all this stuff. You ask a dog what two plus two is. They've got no idea, you know, you know, so, so, but they can recognize things. You can teach them to do things. They know sounds. They know what food is. You can train them for, for feeding, training them to do things. I think, you know, if you had a cart pet and spent enough time doing it, you know, eventually, you could probably get it to do the same sorts of things. Yeah. Interesting. James, this has been fascinating. Yes. What do you, what should I have asked you about this subject that I haven't? I don't think there's much. I think, you know, I've got some notes here and I've kind of, I've gone through it lots and, and despite everything that I've said here, you know, we still go and catch a lot of fish in spite of this. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's an echo change and not many people talk about it. There's been lots of books uh, uh, written about bait and lots and lots of thoughts into bait. I just think it's it's have a think about if efficient as well, because 
nature eyesight is is so important to um to to every other animal that has it so important um assuming that a carp has bad eyesight because it doesn't do things that you can, you know you can't see things that you can't see etc cetera, etc cetera. completely forget that it, it, it's they can probably see better just be aware of it interesting stuff yeah i'm just looking at the rest of my notes here and and uh, yeah, sure. uh no there's not there's not much there i mean yeah brilliant do you want to i, I know you're so obviously you're, you're in canada sure we've yeah. covered this at, at this point certainly in my intro yeah. You're um you're doing something in in Canada. You've got a project that you're launching. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Sure. Like yeah. So so um a few years ago, uh, a group of guys over here sort of started off the, the the Canadian Carp Society. So so carp fishing in Canada. Uh, I uh um I fished all over Europe. I fished lots of places in the UK. Uh, um, I think it's some of the best in the world for for um for what it offers you know it, it, it's you in see canada. lots about talking about in canada you know people talking about sense of adventure and and going yeah. and fishing with the unknown and, and that sort of thing um where we are in toronto here you know people people think about our canadian winters and and skiing and mountains and all that sort of thing couldn't be further from the truth where you know the the the, the summers here are um June, July, August, we have 30 degree heat. You know, it's it's absolutely glorious. We're the same, can I never remember it's longitude or latitude, but basically Greece, southern France, Italy, we're the same sort of height, distance away from the equator. So we have we have amazing times. Um and there's just carp everywhere. There's carp in in we've got venues, um we've got Lake Ontario at the end of my street. So it, it, it's it's an ocean, not a lake. If you can imagine fishing in in, a, in the sea, you know, going to the coast and fishing in the sea for carp. That's kind of one thing you can do here. Or you can go to a park lake or, or a river or whatever. But around here, carp are in a mall. Some some places have got a lot, some places have got not many, but um wherever you go, it's free to fish. Well, you pay you pay a full forty bucks. Uh, for a license, forty dollars, and that will last me for three years, and I can turn up and fish anywhere I want, unless it's a, a private land. Um, and there's just lakes and waters everywhere. I think we've got two hundred and fifty thousand lakes in in Ontario, and most of the ones in southern Ontario have got carp in. So every day is an adventure. You can have a completely different choice. Jeez. However, mm -hmm. sorry, go on. No, go on. You you go. On. Yeah, yeah. So so and, and the fish here are wild. You know that they, they are. Uh, the fish we catch uh, um, are complete, completely wild. You know, I'm going to say 99% of the time they've never seen a hook before. There, there are some lakes and some areas um, where, you know, now more people are fishing for them. You do start recognizing certain fish and, and, and people will be able to, to look at individuals, even on somewhere, you know, the size of, of, of Lake Ontario, which is, um, as I said, as I, say, I, think, I think it's 1.25 million acres. So the Orient is six and a half thousand um but but lake ontario you know th there's still people will still catch the same carp from the same area uh um of the lake um time after time and i've actually caught two fish in the same day twice four years apart from the same area so so you know you... where have these but, but, fish where have these carp come from um so they they were brought over as food sort of in the 1850s i think it was 1840s 1850s and released as food for the settlers that first came over and um they're they're naturalized now sort of through the, the st lawrence uh waterway and, and and through a lot of the uh um, the, the lakes around here they're, they're classed as a natural fish because they've been here so long um we get a lot of talk around uh invasive species you know that, that they uh, um they're not seen as great for for the local environment because they do muddy waters up you know what it's like at spawning that they'll lake ontario bay you know if you've got a, an area like a shallow reedy bay like you would have around the edge when the carp get up there in the spring they just you know, you've got a couple of thousand fish get in there they just smash it to bits well, and, why is and that a, got problem? a bad reputation sorry why is that a problem um because it 
you know, it muddies the water and it makes weed, like people see weeds and that sort of thing. And it's just a, a preconception about it. You know, it, it, it's carp do that and, and shouldn't be doing that. Even though it's been going on for 150 years, it's quite a negative view around it. Because um, we don't, we, we, the, they don't want to see, they want to see clear waters rather than muddy water. Yeah, they want clear waters. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, um, the, the fishing here, everybody goes fishing, you know, it, 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 it's very, very common um more so more so than the uk um but um carp fishing is very it's not thought of as much at all uh, um because of that, that that people think that they're invasive and then people think that they're bottom feeders so they don't taste good and they're muddy um and that they they put other species at risk sort of the bass and that sort of thing I don't believe they do because they've lived here 150 years and we've got amazing populations of salmon and trout and um, bass, uh, uh, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, et cetera, in, in the waterways. So they live side by side, but there's this invasive preconception. And, and there is uh, issues in, in the US at the moment around other Asian carp, um, big heads, black carp, um, there's another one as well, and I should know it. And also grass carp, they, they're, they're very worried about those here. Um, and, and there's a lot of work going into stopping them spreading around for, for the, the impact it has on, on ecosystems and, and that sort of thing. So they get a pretty negative light. So what I'm I'm doing, and, and you know, the Canadian Carp Society has kind of inspired me to do this because there's more people doing it, but it's just set up something that helps uh, people catch carp in Canada. So I make uh you know i've got a line of rigs that i make that are are you know super super strong um because everything's wired you know there's no no such thing as a gravel bar here or, or anything like that you'll get you shells make ready tied rigs yeah ready tied rigs and leaders but yeah. 65 pound lead core you know 80 pound uh, uh, uh nylon i do some rigs for the river so that um with floats on so they keep line off off the bottom so you don't get snagged on so, on boulders so you know you might go on. Pres presumably carp fishing is in its infancy in your country yes yes why is there a market of tying rigs for people what, like, what, surely that's kind of like advancing several steps from where it should be well, well i think the 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 thing is that um you've definitely like with within the the uk you know i think what's happened is that over the years people have always gone and bought the components for their rigs and tied them together and and, mm. and um uh you know made their own rigs for their own occasions and stuff but there's awful i've been doing that for years as well i love you know i love any playing with rigs playing with bait anything like that but what i've found is that over the last 10 years i'm using the same leaders and the same rigs all the time and uh, you know, there's, they definitely work the best for me, you, you, you know, and, and what I'm doing, people will go to a, a Canadian tire here, which is the equivalent of like a Wilkinson's or something, and then they'll go and buy 10 different lures because um, that's what they do for their fishing. They're quite happy to go and do that. So my thinking is, well, why don't I just do rigs and leaders for carp fishing to make it as easy as possible for people to go carp fishing? You know, rather than going and buying a big hook that they're going to put on their line. We all did it as kids where you tie a weight on the line, um, side hook a bit of corn, throw it out, hook a fish, smashed up. You, know, you lose your, your rig, you lose your, your weight, your line's gone, et cetera, uh, um, you know, wrapped around a branch or whatever. So what I want to do is just say, here you go. Here's a big heavy leader that's going to work. Here's a big, really strong rig. And then you can use these and they're going to help you catch carpet. Yeah. So I'm doing that, and then um, I, I was looking at look, like tuitions as well and teaching people because I think there's a lot of, um, as I said, there's a lot, lot, lots of people go fishing. Lots of people will go out, and you know, it's all lure fishing, pike, salmon, uh, uh, bass, fishing for food. Catch and release is a lot more popular here now. Canadians are typically very proud of the Canadian Canadian countryside and and and, and the environment. Mm. So there's a lot, lot more putting things back. Um, and there's all these carp that uh you know grow to five times the size of any bass that you're ever going to catch they pull really hard and there's loads of them everywhere so you know to try and get people people doing that out and enjoying it and and, and getting over the step of oh it's completely different to to go in and catch in on a spinner or a lure sure it is but it's still you can still teach people the simplicity about it what what to do where to 
go and catch them, hair rigs, leaders, that sort of thing. So, so I want to teach them and try and get it out there because like I say, I think it's some of the best fishing in the carp fishing that I've ever experienced anywhere. Um, and I think other people should, should be able to go out and do it as well. So let's say, and what, go on, sorry. No, go on. You, you go. I was going to say what, what I've, what I've found too, is that through the Canadian carp site, what Wayne and, uh, 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 he's an expat. Um, he set it up a few years ago because what he found was that there was, um, lots of Facebook groups and that sort of thing. And it was all very clicky. And he's like, no, screw all that. Let's go and set up. I'm going to say the, 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 the closest thing in the UK would be the, the British Carp Study Group. Um, you pay a fee to join. Uh, and then you just get together as you know, there's some people out there that are as crazy into it as anybody you would ever meet in the UK. And then there's occasional anglers as well, much like the UK. Um, but they're great friendships and, and Canadian people are so lovely. And, and I, I, I love carp fishing because I make so many friends. I just want more people doing it really. Yeah, absolutely. So someone like myself. Yeah. I've uh, obviously been carp fishing, you know, quite a while do you what what would you would you kind of recommend it as a destination for someone like myself or do you think it's more suited to a, a different type of angler what what's your thoughts on that so i would say there's something for everyone here apart from i'm gonna say like apart from like you turn up at a day ticket lake with a wood chip swim and and um yeah uh, that's okay so if you like something a bit more wild and a bit more adventurous then then it's perfect and you, you see the story you know samir uh samir's videos you know when he went on that biking video not seen um, it. i don't, don't uh know. yeah he's done a video on youtube it's as good as as any fishing film i've seen brilliant editing and and you know he's got this sense of adventure of going off road and fishing these places for wild fish um Jim Shelley does does some stuff on typography. John Timmermans, he kind of you know you know he's got some stuff on YouTube as well. It's that sort of fishing. It's turning up, right. not knowing what you've got in front of you, and um, casting out and seeing what's there. You know there, there are, you know you, I think people will see um, the stuff that Paul Hunt he does fully um, uh, full board. You know you know he he does trips up in the St Lawrence area and and. I think people just all assume that it's lots of 15, 20 pound compliments. There are a lot of them, but thinking that all Canadian carp fishing like that is thinking linear or like all UK carp fishing is like linear person mm -hmm. knows one, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there are so many different varieties. Um, and yeah, I think it depends on what you want. I've got, I've got stretches. So I've got, you know, you know, for me, I'm quite happy to go to a park lake and fish a park lake that's full of fish and catch a few fish on pop-ups or whatever, or we can do a campaign. Um, on areas where they're low stock and um you know you're fishing for for known big ones you know much the same as the uk there was a uh, um jason Ryder actually was was someone yeah. that kind of put me onto it um there's a stretch of river north of of toronto in a place called peterborough um where jason fished and there's a picture in his book of of this this area um he caught loads of fish from it and, and what What's happened there is the fish have died back over the years, but there are some known fish. There's like three or four big mirrors there, um, and one really big common. Um, and I fished that for a couple of years and 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 went through and you know I've caught. A f Actually, it was very hard fishing. You know, I'm, I'm used to it. I think I caught seven or eight from the stretch over a year, doing probably twenty thirty nights. Um, and my friend Will fished it last year, trying to catch the big common that I caught. Um, I think he did something like 25 nights and had one fish. So, you know, you can have your campaign target fishing. You can go down to Lake Ontario and and, 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 and fish an area where there's a few fish and catch one after the other. It's yeah. complete variety. Um, it's wild and you don't know what you're going to get. I think that I like that. Sense. I've spoken to Jason about his, uh, his trip actually. Um, right. Yeah. I'd like it. I, I um, have a little bit of a hankering to take my family away somewhere abroad and uh and just just go out there do something just to feel small i mean when i think of canada it's right. probably again complete cliche <laughs> but i think right. of just you know mountains just absolute abyss of nature it's probably not like that right. at all um, oh it totally is it, it, it totally is but that's just one part of it there's all yeah. these other parts of it as well and and yeah. there's actually um you've got a lot of uh, um the 
east coast is you know there's lots of lots of as you go into to uh new brunswick and, and that sort of area right over sort of north of maine and, and and that side of the us there's a big mountain range there so you've got lots of forests and, and and that sort of things more hilly mountains you know more more uh, uh breck and beacons type thing and then you go across the other side to, to bc and and you've got you know you drive hours you know you can drive across the country it takes you couple of days to do it non-stop but you'll drive for miles of it completely flat and then you get this mountain range it just appears out of nowhere um and then you've got 12 hours of mountains as well so th there's a lot of space a lot a lot of space um but you definitely feel small here mm -hmm. so to give you, you like the, the the sizes and, and stuff about how to get there, my um my brother lives in canada he lives in calgary which is about two and a two and a half thousand kilometers from here uh, uh, and you can drive there, but I think for, for me to drive from here to get to him is about six roads. Uh, um, but in the middle, there's just one road that you drive on for however many hours. But but the Trans Canadian Highway, so you can get across it fairly easy. But it, it, it's uh, it's an intriguing place, and and you know if people are looking for something different to do, then then uh, um, chucking your rods in a suitcase and, and, or, you know, getting some travel rods or whatever, coming and hiring a car and going on a road trip, uh, uh, is quite something. No, well, there's guns here, but not like in the U S I think people always get a bit cautious and wary of that, but, um, um, we, we don't, you don't see people walking down the street with guns or anything like that. So it's pretty safe. Um, and you can just turn up in places and, and fish out the back of your car. That's what Jason did. You know, Jason would hire a car with his kit and then they would drive around and, you know, whether they sleep in the car or, or at motels and just go and do a fishing road trip. Interesting. I'd... Maybe one day yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, <laughs> I'll take it's... everyone out there. Yeah. One of the, the um, again, going to, to the fishing, that there is a um, a culture certainly around uh, uh, Toronto. It's like a, this thing, cottage culture. So, okay. um Everybody lives in the city. You know, Toronto's a pretty big city, you know, six million people. Um, but at the weekends, what people do is they leave the city and then go to all the lakes and, and all the rivers and everywhere outside of the city, like two or three hours away. And they'll have second homes out there that are all wow. like on on lakes and, and um, on rivers and in the countryside. Um, and they'll have a boat there and there's all water sports. People go and do lots of water skiing and, and, and uh, um, all sorts like that. Massive boating, massive, massive boating um, uh, um, crowd here. Um, but people will go out, lots of swimming in lakes and, and all that sort of thing. And, and it's like a mini, mini break, you know, every weekend you're going away swimming like you would at a beach. Amazing. So, so yeah, it, it, it's a, uh, and, and the water's warm, you know, it's, it's like I say, we're the same as Southern France and stuff. So you can go and stay at cottages, do a road trip, Airbnbs. It's phenomenal. And a lot of fun, you know, and people are very, very friendly. Very friendly. Sounds amazing. Uh, it sounds like yes. you've got a great project out there. I wish you every yeah, success. Yeah, it's called Kiam. It's called Kiam. So, uh, yeah, have you got uh, a website? A, yeah, it's uh, kiamcarp.com or kiamcarp.ca. And, you know, what I've done is I've gone and um, built the website and it's kind of designed to for beginners to come on and have a look. It's very visual, lots of pictures. Um, we'll give you an idea of what it's like here. You know, you know, you, I can go and fish at the end of the road and it's like fishing off Brighton Beach or, or maybe, um, you know, some squirrel away on some snaggy river or something like that. But it will give you an idea of what it's like out here and, and, and what the... Uh, um, the fishing is like and what the sort of fish lots of commons there's a few mirrors um but you can only fish what's in front of you and and what i've kind of learned is that commons do actually look different as well when you when you've caught enough of them you begin to notice well, how, how some of them look very different to others as oh, well. absolutely yeah. mirrors are, are are like a um we're like the golden grail out here you know it's it's the, the you caught a grip you caught a mirror i think last year i caught two um, but I might have gone for five or six years without catching any at all. Um, so, but, but the you website out to us, mate. It's Kiam. So it's K I Y A M carp.com or, or dot C A. So K I Y A M C A R P.com. Yeah. And, uh, um, my, the, the name of it, it's actually a, um, first nations. It's an Indian, uh, uh, 
I ever get this right, Iroquois, I think it is, tribe, uh, First Nations people. It's a word and it means let it go. But in kind of let it go in in an argument. So if you've had an argument with someone and, and you know, you've had a bit of a bust up, um, you say Kiam at the end of it. And it basically means that's it. You know, we've done the argument. We've done where we are. We let it go. We don't talk about it anymore. We have a difference of opinions. But of course, with carp fishing as well, I, you know, with the, with the catch and release um, for the let it go as well, I thought it kind of went well with that and, and kind of with uh, releasing stress and relaxing too. So I thought it was quite good. Um, so yeah, that's where, where the name came from. Proper, proper Canadian. So it would be natural for me to round up now. I've just gone on the website. Sure. <laughs> I've gone on the um, the hit section, which is under. So I've gone onto the menu, gone news and gallery, clicked on the gallery. Second bit down, kit. You've got stones, which I yes. I used uh, real stones with swivels embedded in them in years right. because I thought it was looking very natural. You've got these stones with it looks like elastic bands around them. Um, right. Why? So, so, so again, uh, um, you know, there's a little bit there around, so people can just go and fishing for them straight away. But the the other thing with it is that um, I, I think lead is a terrible thing to use in carp fishing. It, it, right. It's you go to the World World Health Organization and look on their website. When, you know, everything that we know about mm. lead is that it's bad but it's quite a good weight for, for casting out into a lake yeah. and, uh, yeah. uh, um, you know, and it does a job there. I kind of, I've, I've the opinion that, all right, it does a job, but I don't want to be casting it out into the lake. I'd rather go and use something non-toxic mm. and not risk leaving littering with lead somewhere and leaving tackle somewhere but with the, 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 the nature of the Canadian waters as well. Like I said, they're really wild. They're really snaggy. You know, you could be fishing with a, a river and, and you might have a, a clear area to present your bait, but between you and that area, there could be like muscle covered boulders, the size of cars. Um, and if you let go, if your line goes around it, then you've cut off, you're leaving tackle there. You know, you're leaving lead, you're leaving weights and stuff. So I kind of like, no, just, just, start using rocks and, and start using other things before people were using weights and the arsley bombs and that sort of thing you know, you know they used stones in fishing for for thousands of years until we came yeah. up with with leads so i'm kind of like well i'm just going to go back to that i might not be able to cast 150 yards but i don't need to hmm. uh, um and i'd rather just use a, a, a I'd be quite happy dropping a rock on the bottom than a piece of lead yeah makes perfect sense makes perfect sense yeah James, i i, I uh, yeah, sorry I really enjoyed this. Thanks ever so much. I know you've cool. got some Thank other interesting viewpoints on on other areas, um, particularly sugars, carbohydrates, etc. So who knows? Yeah. Maybe we'll yeah. we'll get you back on. Cool. I'd love to. Yeah. So thank you very much for for having me, Sam. And and um, you know, I, I think I've said to you before. I really, I think there's a there's a huge amount of uh, uh, people out there that really appreciate these podcasts. Um, you know you when it comes down to the technical side of things and really getting into the nitty gritty, it's quite limited on what you can find out there now. And, and I think you're one of the only places and, and yourself and the guests that sort of give me many, many happy hours of, of uh, listening and certainly get the great matter going. So I just want to thank you as well for, for doing this. Oh, mate, you, you're very welcome. Very kind of you to say so. And it's much appreciated. Cool. Thanks right, ever thank so much, James. Much. Appreciate it. Man. Thanks, Sam. Bye-bye. If you're still here and you happen to be listening on the Apple Podcast app or Apple iTunes, please take a few moments, leave me a review, let me know how we're doing with this podcast. A, it's really nice to hear from you, and B, it helps this podcast stay relevant and stay in the ratings. If it doesn't stay in the ratings, it falls behind, um, people don't listen to it, and obviously that means there's not much point me doing it anymore. So if you can take a moment to leave me a review, I'd really appreciate it. If you're not listening on an Apple device, I don't think you can leave us a review, unless there's some means that I'm not aware of. Um, but Nonetheless, I appreciate you listening. It does mean a lot to me. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach out on social media. That's it. I look forward to bringing the next episode to you very soon.